a very warm welcome to another instalment from the channel that is Jono's Graveyard Jaunts. Now for today's video I'm once again at the incredible Wolford Road Cemetery on the outskirts of the city of Leicester where the person who features in today's video is laid to rest. This person has an amazingly ornate Celtic cross as a memorial now the first map shows where the city of Leicester sits in relation to the county of Leicestershire and the second map shows where the actual layout of the cemetery itself sits in relation to Leicester city. Now the person who features in today's video was a very wealthy, generous Victorian industrialist and philanthropist. And in today's video I shall visit the grade 2 listed mill house in Nether Langworth, Nottinghamshire where this person was born and spent his early childhood. I shall also visit the former non-conformist preparatory school where this individual studied, which is now in turn a museum. I shall also visit the stunning property he lived in, known as Brookfield, on the outskirts of the city of Leicester in a very affluent area now known as Stonygate. I shall also visit this individual's finding resting place here at Walford Road Cemetery. Now the person who features in today's video is a man by the name of Thomas Fielding Johnson or Fielding Johnson as he was formerly known before he adopted the name of Thomas. Among his many acts of public spiritedness and generosity was the donation in 1919 of a 37 acre, 15 hectare site and buildings for the establishment of Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland University Colleges which is now finally called the University of Leicester. Now, Fielding Johnson was born at Netherland with Nottinghamshire, the third of eight children born to John Good Johnson and Eliza Fielding. So here we are at the beautiful grade two listed mill house in Netherlandworth. And this is where the young Thomas Fielding Johnson was born and spent the early years of his life. Now, grade two listing essentially means a building of special interest and every effort must be taken to preserve it. It's absolutely beautiful as you can see. So this is the old mill house and grade two listed. It's a beautiful property and it was derelict. It's now been given a new lease of life. It is obviously a private residence, so I want to, um, I want to be as discreet as I can be. He soon followed his elder brother to study at the Nonconformist Preparatory School in Leicester, a building which is now occupied by the Newark Museum and is also an art gallery. What we're looking at now is the Newark Museum and Art Gallery, and this is where Sir Thomas Fielding Johnson attended back in the day when it was a non preparatory school. So look at this beautiful entrance here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pan around. And what we're looking at now is what's commonly known as New Walk. We're going on up to Victoria Park. And it was, um, it's a rare example of, Geor of a Georgian pedestrian promenade. And it was established in 1785. And it's very, very beautiful. And what I'm gonna do is I'll pan around again. You can see some of the properties here. So it was um, a very, very eminent part of Leicester with the upper middle classes living here and there are lots and lots of pocket parks so I'll put some old photographs up so you can compare then you can compare then and now but it's absolutely beautiful if you are in Leicester it's well worth checking out so it's now called the New Walk it was formerly called Queen's Walk and as I say it's a very rare example established in 1785 of a Georgian pedestrian promenade so this would have been the non-preparatory school that Thomas attended. Is the actual the sign on the New Walk. New Walk has been a traffic-free promenade for more than 200 years. Please respect its unique character, no cycling. So this is actually on the wall. And just look at some of these beautiful buildings alongside. So it was for the landy gentry back in the day. Now, Fielding Johnson moved into the Leicester home of his uncle, his mother's brother and aunt, Joseph and Martha Fielding. His aunt and uncle had no children of their own and Fielding Johnson was adopted by them in 1840, aged 12 years old. 
Now this sort of arrangement was not uncommon among the Victorian middle classes and allowed the wealth earned by successful parents to be passed down the generations and retained within the actual families themselves. Previously known simply as Thomas Johnson, from then on he adopted the surname that he was now known by, i.e. Fielding Johnson. In 1855, Fielding Johnson married Julia Christiana Stone, the daughter of Samuel Stone and Mary Chamberlain. The marriage ended after only four years as a result of Christiana's premature death in 1859. And their marriage in turn produced two sons, Thomas Fielding Jr. and Joseph, who died aged only six months old. Now, Fielding Johnson remarried in 1863. His second wife came from his existing social circle and was by and was with a lady by the name of Agnes Paget. The second marriage, which appears to have been a happy one, lasted until Agnes died in 1917. Now, from 1869 until his death, the family lived at Brookfield, a large Victorian house standing in its own miniature estate and modelled on the seats of the local gentry. Situated in the open countryside along the London Road and just beyond the borough boundary, it was one of the first houses to be built in what later became known as the residential suburb of Stony Gate. So what we're looking at now is the house that Thomas Fielding Johnson um, spent most of his life in and indeed died in. It's called Brookfield and now it's part of um, Leicester University's business school. It's absolutely stunning. If I just zoom in on that beautiful arched entrance there. So this is what it looks like now and what I'll do is I'll put some old pictures of it up in terms of what it used to look like. So this is called Brookfield. It's on London Road in a very affluent area called Stony Gate. Fielding Johnson's adoptive father was a freeman of the borough and an owner of the successfully established spinning business. He made Thomas a partner in 1852 and on his uncle's death in the same year, Thomas assumed control aged just 24 years old. Now, Fielding Johnson appears to have been both a talented but careful businessman who recognised that his best hopes for sustainable success lay in developing an effective business model in one factory and then duplicating it in others. And it does appear to have worked. Now, during his own lifetime, at least, throughout the 1914-18 war, the Fielding and Johnson Company supplied more yarn to the government for army purposes than any other firm in England. And like many of his Victorian counterparts, Fielding Johnson seems to have had a painstaking and comprehensive approach and concerned himself with commercial, technical and employment aspects of the business. And the picture that emerges from the history books is that of a hard-working, decent man whose business ambitions were a means to achieving broader social goals and was, who was content where they could be satisfied with a part of England that he knew best and with people that he had grown up with. And this, by contrast, is very different from today's modern entrepreneur who adopts a more fragmented, fragmented globalised approach. The Fielding Johnson Company was one of the first in Leicester to use steam engines in its factories. Now, the factory in Bond Street spun wool sourced in England and later New Zealand, and in 1861, two steam engines named Juno and Jupiter were installed to operate new Brook House knitting frames. These two engines were not replaced until the 1940s, and in 1862, the firm bought a second factory in Leicester at Abbey Mills, and in 1885, a third at Anchor Mill in Nuneaton. The two engines in this latter, named Annie and Elizabeth, were modelled on James Watt's original steam engine and ran night and day between 1890 and 1938, with only three stoppages of more than a week. The company in turn continued to innovate long after Thomas's death, and in 1957, Anchor Mill was the first premises in England in which the new Bradford system of worsted weaving, drawing and spinning wool was introduced. Now, this revolutionary new system combined the old labour-intensive system of drawing, spinning, twisting and winding large numbers of machines into a single system where only three operations were needed. 
and this in turn allowed more water to be produced on the same floor area and this much more and was in turn much more efficient. Thomas Fielding Johnson died on the 18th of March 1921, aged 92 years old. So this is the beautiful ornate Celtic cross of Thomas Fielding Johnson. And just look at the detail on this. It's absolutely incredible. I'm not sure if they're snakes or what they are, but I think it's really interesting. Comments um, below, guys. Let me know what you think they are. They look like, um, I don't know, like snakes or something. It's beautiful, the detail. So this is Walford Road Cemetery then. The final resting place of Thomas and his wife Agnes. In honoured memory of Thomas Fielding Johnson, born at Langwith near Mansfield. That's where we went to um, Nether Langwith at the old mill house there earlier on in the video, died March 18th, 1921, in his 93rd year. He lived his long life in Leicester, a strong man, ever zealous for the welfare of the citizens, in loving memory of Agnes, for 54 years, the devoted wife of Thomas Fielding Johnson, JP, and the daughter of Alfred Paget, JP, died Leicester in a 77th year at Brookfield Leicester and that's obviously the beautiful property that we've been to on London Road Brookfield House so rest in peace all reunited God bless I have produced a few videos now on Victorian business people and a common denominator with all seems to be that of philanthropy i.e. happy workers with good pay, decent living accommodation, health care, access to education are far more productive and ultimately this is for the greater good of both the business and the population in general. If we think of Cabris who created the village of Bourneville for the workers and Sir Titus Salt who created Saltaire and of course Sir Joseph Rowntree who built the village of New Earswick for the poor. Now this sadly seems to be lacking in today's modern society, with poor pay, zero hour contracts and very precarious working conditions. Now that concludes the video guys, thank you very much for watching. If you have enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and comment. And as you know, to subscribe to the channel does not cost anything.